CVD, and uh, he will talk about how to code nanostructure smoothly and conformally with CVD today. Welcome. Thank you very much. My great pleasure to be here. Uh, incidentally, how many of you are involved in uh, synthesis of devices at the nanoscale? Great. Well, then my talk will have meaning to many of you, and I hope to uh, inform and, and educate all of you about some of the real difficulties in synthesizing nanostructures and some contemporary approaches to get over this, these problems. Now, being here in the micro nanotechnology lab, right, I am, as they say, preaching to the choir if I tell you about some of today's modern micro and nanoscale devices for which we need thin film materials. So here are four examples in which actually the, the function of the device depends not on the fact that we first made a structure, for example, using RIE to etch a deep trench, but in addition, our ability to coat the walls of that feature with a material of choice. So for, <clears throat> and here we have a photonic crystal, and looking closely, you see thin film here. Uh, a deep trench could be a DRAM capacitor. This could be part of a back-end metallization in ULSI. In the convex sense, a probe tip for scanning microscopy, or of course, a surface coating in MEMS for reasons of tribology or contact. In all cases, we make the basic structure, but we then have to put our material on it. That's a difficult problem. Uh, and <clears throat> let me just pause for a minute to point that out. Let's say we have a very uh, uh, deep structure like this or like the trench. You'll see here an essentially uniform coating of the walls. What's interesting about that is all the material that eventually ended up on the walls had to pass through the relatively narrow opening. So we have a coating process that puts coating out here on the top, on the flat surface, produces a thickness x. Here this has a depth to width ratio of almost 20. So the internal surface area here is about 40 times as big. And all the material that wound up in there was transported through this opening. So I get 40 times as much material through the little opening as out on the surface. And yet it's all the same thickness. So you can see what's very curious about these processes. Now, many of you have heard about atomic layer deposition. It's a marvelous technique for producing uniform coatings. Our work is actually related in some specific ways to ALD. Uh, I'm a routine contributor at the ALD conferences, but what I'll show you is that CVD has its own sphere of interesting applicability. Chemical vapor deposition at a lower growth temperature can give truly excellent conformality at a very competitive growth rate. And in fact, in very, very deep structures, there are cases we outrun ALD. So that's interesting. Now I've alluded already to the fact, an issue, in standard operation, there's an inherent trade-off between how conformal the film is, that is, can you keep the thickness uniform everywhere, and how quickly you can grow it. It's really a direct competition between transport and surface reaction rate that creates that competition. It's a function, so in chemical vapor deposition, the species I want to deposit is contained within a volatile molecule. We flow that over the substrate. The substrate is hot and that molecule breaks down to give the coating you want and reject any parts of the molecule that are not needed as secondary volatile products that diffuse away. How this works depends very much on the chemical reactivity of the molecule. So how well the coating works depends on the identity of the precursor. This means the molecule I've synthesized and amusing. It turns out it depends strongly on the partial pressure and temperature, and there has been no simple analytic theory paren until now, meaning I'm going to show you one. So let's start with the puzzle. Here is an SEM cross-section of a, of a trench. So this is SiO2. It's been etched into these lovely trenches. 
Here's a particular precursor. This makes the material hafnium diboride, which is highly refractory and highly conductive. It's a beautiful diffusion barrier. So here's the precursor, a wonderfully volatile molecule. We flow it in over this structure at 275 degrees C, and we get this rotten result. Rotten result. It's relatively thick on the parts that are exposed to the gas. It gets thinner and thinner. Actually, the microstructure is poor. It's columnar and rough. And if we had let this growth proceed a little bit longer, because it's growing faster near the opening, these two walls would eventually touch. It would pinch off, leaving the interior mostly open. May I ask uh, the precursor? Yeah. You'll see that in an instant. Here is. Another set of trenches, actually with even higher aspect ratio, it is the same precursor and the same temperature. And now the film thickness is the same everywhere, and it's beautifully smooth. And I changed exactly one thing, and that's the precursor partial pressure. Here I intentionally made it what I know to be a little too low, a tenth of a millitour. Here I bumped it up to 80 millitour. By the way, this precursor has a vapor pressure of 15 torr, which is more than many liquid solvents. So in the can, it's a powdery solid, but its vapor pressure is like a powerful solvent. It's an amazing molecule. But I changed only the pressure, and I went from something that was pretty bad to something that looks like ALD. Right? So what's going on? We need to understand this. <clears throat> Fundamentally, the issue is quite straightforward. The gas must enter, and it's moving by uh, molecular diffusion through the opening. It has to get to the bottom, does that by colliding off the walls, but it's consumed on the way. You're consuming this molecule to grow the film. So inherently, the pressure is falling, and we're simply solving the transport equation, fixed second law if you like that says that the pressure will drop due to the growth rate on the two walls. So the precursor is depleted. Now, if the growth rate were simply proportional to pressure, and this is the curve describing the fall in pressure, that would be the shape of the film thickness also, intrinsically. So there are two possible strategies. If I can turn down the reaction probability, which is to say turn the growth rate way down, my strategy then is to make this pressure drop as small as possible. So there's a lot of gas in there, but I'm hardly using it. I remind you, if you have an unreactive gas, let's say a noble gas, argon, nitrogen, and you put it in any structure and wait till it equilibrates, the pressure is the same everywhere. That's what the laws of gases tell you, right? Well, there's a second strategy, which is to minimize the dependence of the growth rate on pressure. And you can already anticipate that is the winning strategy. Let's look for a moment, though, at the first one. Solve the diffusion reaction equation. Assign a number, which is the probability that a molecule will react and make film each time it hits the wall. Okay? That could be as much as unity, or it could be something smaller. You can solve analytically fixed second law, given a constant reaction probability. And here's the idea. If you want a certain step coverage, which is the thickness at the bottom divided by the thickness at the top, you will therefore need this value of reaction probability in a trench of this aspect ratio. Now, I don't show 100%. We can't get there. Let's take, what would you like, 90%. Here's the middle curve. If I'm in a trench that's 40 to 1 in depth, that's fine. My reaction probability has to be 10 to the minus fourth. So the molecule must hit my surface 10,000 times in order to react once. Is this realistic? Well, what you could do is to lower the substrate temperature until Reaction barely occurs, but it's really slow and it won't be stable because it means you're saying, I want to adjust 
to that razor's edge where growth is almost impossible, but if your reactor has temperature fluctuations of even a few degrees or non-uniformity across the substrate, your growth rate will be varying around. So this is a failing route, and we need approach number two. Now, in a sense, nothing is totally new under the sun. You look back carefully in the literature, and Shea, back 20 years ago, pointed out that in a few systems, people had seen growth rate saturations. And it turns out that's perfect. So here's the idea. We're going to examine a couple systems. Here's our hafnium diboride from the same precursor you saw. Here's tungsten from tungsten hexafluoride and hydrogen. Real experimental data are the symbols. And starting at low pressure, the initial rise in growth rate is linear in pressure. And then it rolls over in both these systems. I want to emphasize the rolling over part by sketching lines on here if it didn't roll over. If the surface, so when you have a linear initial behavior, that corresponds to some effective sticking probability, right? If that were to remain constant, the growth rate would keep on rising like this. But it doesn't. So you see how really rather strong the rollover is. Let me point one other thing out. For this molecule, for example, the vapor pressure is 15 tor, and this is one and a half millitor. So I can actually move to the right by a factor of 10,000. Now the growth rate, as it turns out, will pretty much saturate, and the flux hitting the surface will get 10,000 times larger. So in an effective sense, growth rate divided by impinging flux is now a number like 1 in 10 to the fourth. Actually, you can operate at 1 in 10 to the 6th, if you like. But not because growth is barely occurring. Growth is certainly occurring. Here's 15, 20 nanometers a minute, which is fine if we're making a nanostructure and the film has to be right, 5 or 10 nanometers thick. Right? Take you a minute, less than a minute. So saturation is very powerful. Let's express this a different way. I'll put a cartoon of a trench on here. If you start where at the opening of the trench, the precursor partial pressure is rather low, and if that pressure falls inside, the growth rate falls, which is what we're trying to depict here. If I take the same trench and I have the pressure at the opening be higher, it's still true that the pressure falls inside, but the growth rate barely falls. Now, here this is an inexact mapping between the pressure drop and the trench. I'll show you the exact mapping shortly. So saturated surface kinetics. Now, I'm going to give this to you in two parts. Empirically speaking, the growth rate saturation obeys an empirical form like this with two rate coefficients, both temperature activated. Here's the gas pressure. So what do we see? At lo in the low pressure limit, where this term in the denominator is small, it looks linear with pressure. K1T is the intrinsic reactivity of this molecule with the surface. What about high pressure, where this term in the denominator is bigger than 1? Pressure then cancels out. In the high pressure limit, the growth rate saturates is the ratio of these two terms. I will point out shortly this corresponds exactly to what surface science says. But at this stage, we don't have to invoke a surface science hypothesis. All we have to do is say the growth rate, whatever determines it, behaves this way. OK? By the way, nomenclature. I keep saying low pressure and high pressure. And for many people, high pressure is, oh, atmospheric pressure CVD. Laminar flow, boundary layers, substrates at a tilt. My high might be 10 millitor to a tor, which is still in molecular flow. So just to be clear about that. It's all about surface kinetics. It's not about boundary layers. <clears throat> 
a little point, there is uh, various literature out there that fits these sort of behaviors over a very limited range and says, oh, it's first order in pressure or second order in pressure. But when it has this kind of dependence, there is no apparent reaction order because it goes from first order to zero order. Now, traditionally, in the coding business, the attitude has been, well, you know, this is some right, complicated function of pressure. right? It's going to vary with pressure. And I'm coding a deep trench. And you know, I'm going to have to use numerical solutions for my thickness profile. And that's OK, but we all know that whenever you, you use a numerical simulation, the physical insight can be harder to grasp. So it turns out there's a very interesting analytic approximation here. And here's the idea. What we're interested in is the case where the thickness is almost uniform. So how can we use an appropriate approximation? So step coverage, growth rate at the bottom divided by the top, is just the growth rate at the slightly reduced pressure at the bottom compared to the pressure at the top. So what we need to do is find out how much the pressure droops. Let us use an approximation. Let's say the growth rate is constant. Now, when you're solving the diffusion equation, there are two boundary conditions that are particularly easy to solve. One is constant reaction probability, which I showed you earlier. The other one is constant consumption rate. And you can just solve this in the back of an envelope during my talk and check what I'm saying. Now the solution for the pressure drop is analytical. By the way, it's the worst case scenario. If the thickness you're growing actually is a little smaller at the bottom, the pressure drop is a little smaller than we've just calculated. So I'm going to calculate conservatively the worst case scenario and see how it turns out. So this is <clears throat> the analytic solution to the pressure drop. And it has some familiar terms, has a growth rate, an aspect ratio. Uh, this is the molecular diffusivity. We have an atomic density of the film just to convert from flux to thickness, right? This little one in here is because of the trench bottom. In any event, if the aspect ratio is large, this becomes larger than one. And it goes approximately this way, like aspect ratio squared. We know the pressure drop. Well, my step coverage, I can express this way, right, which is the differential in growth rate with pressure, and then the pressure drop. So if I have that form about growth rate with k1 of t and k2 of t, I differentiate that, which I put in here. I know delta p from the last slide. And we get, interestingly, a master relationship for chemical vapor deposition. Quite fascinating. All the key parameters are there in one line. And it says uh, that if I want to coat a certain aspect ratio at a certain growth rate with a certain step coverage, and knowing these other parameters, I need a certain pressure of precursor at the opening. This relationship tells you that you can get to that result, which is in scientific terms, way cool. We have one line that tells us what to do, right? Now, you'll notice step coverage can't literally be unity, or this blows up. But it can actually get very close. And we've had cases of step coverage being like 0.98. What does it mean? Well, if I have a precursor that can give me 15 tor at the entrance, I can do almost anything, OK? Now let's create a master diagram, a zone diagram for how CVD can give you conformal growth. We're going to use the experimental parameters of pressure and temperature. By the way, this is a 1 over t scale that increases to the left because I really love temperature to increase to the right. So I'm responsible for that little sign convention. So here's the deal. First, don't consider a trench. Consider a flat surface. That's the bottom line here. 
Now this actually goes up with temperature. What is it saying? At higher temperature, that reaction rate is faster. It turns out it takes more gas pressure to have that flat surface be entered into that saturated growth regime. Right? So there's a fiducial reference point there that it should be most of the way into saturation. That assures that it's nice and uniform. Now let's suppose that you're not on just a flat surface, but you're in a trench. Well, we have an equation for the pressure drop. So due to the growth rate on the walls, what we want is the bottom of the trench does not hit, see any pressure lower than this lower bound. But it means up at the opening of the trench, we have to be a certain amount above that according to the aspect ratio. So for a modest aspect ratio, we're here. For a higher aspect ratio, we're here. The higher the aspect ratio, the more the starting pressure has to be high because we're losing pressure due to consumption in that trench. So this, and we've indicated some other things. Perhaps you don't see growth turn on below a certain temperature. Perhaps at very high temperature, you might have to think about other things like getting out of molecular flow. In reality, that's rare. Thus, we come up with a master diagram for conformal growth in CBD. It says you have some available partial pressure. You have a minimum temperature for growth. You are trying to code some aspect ratio. And for certain molecules in the limit of higher temperature and higher pressure, you might get gas phase reactions you don't want. So we indicate there might be a boundary out there. By the way, certain processes actually require gas phase reaction to create the reactive intermediate. That's not what I'm considering here. And I'll draw a few cartoons on the right of this zone why some precursors don't make it. What could go wrong? Well, maybe the reaction temperature, the onset temperature is too high. That squeezes out the zone. Maybe the precursor pressure is too low. Or maybe the aspect ratio you want to code is too high. So you can squeeze the zone out. So in this way, it's what you can achieve is very dependent on the properties of the precursor. So now we pause because, as I say, in a way, nothing is new under the sun. And look in the literature at, in this case, uh, five cheerfully familiar materials that have all been grown in a very, very conformal way. Now what's interesting about it is every single one has a high vapor pressure precursor. So looking back retrospectively at the literature, why were these all the winners? Well, actually that saturation is, we think, active in almost all cases. So that's interesting. Now I'll change gears here. How many of you right, have some uh, surface science work, right? Class background, taluses, a little bit. We need our friend Irving Langmuir, GE Laboratories, 1920s who talked about what could a molecule do at a surface. It's really quite simple. What we're going to contrast here is a molecule coming down to a surface. And does it hit um, a surface site that is not chemically occupied, or a site where something is sitting and is using up all the available chemical bonding locations? This could be a case, in general, it's a case of weak adsorption. So for example, a molecule comes down. Here is an available surface site. It might stick and reside for a while, or it might not. This is adsorption with some probability. But there's also a rate of desorption if you're sitting there. right? So a sticking event. A desorption event can occur. If you come down and you hit a spot which has already adsorbed molecules, uh, one limiting case is your ability to stick there is zero. There could be systems, particularly at low temperature, where you can form a second layer 
but this is too warm here. So we consider zero sticking on the adsorbed layer. You can see where that will lead to saturation. If I can cover the surface with adsorbed molecules, everything else that comes down just bounces off because there are no binding sites left. Finally, what can occur if this were just a surface in equilibrium with a gas, I only need these first three. But we furthermore are at a temperature where growth can occur. So we consider that an adsorbed species reacts to form film with some reaction rate coefficient and spits off the unneeded ligands shown in cartoon form as two more circles here. Okay, so we have a reversible precursor adsorption on off the surface and irreversible film growth and that will give us exactly the sort of characteristic we saw empirically. In the low pressure limit where the surface is mostly bare, almost everything that comes down finds a bare site, sticks and may later react and at high pressure we have a site blocked surface. How do you solve this? Always in a rate formalism, you write down the differential equation. In this case, you'd write down the surface coverage and has an impingement rate and a loss rate. And in steady state, you just get this solution. So this is the dynamic surface coverage. This is the rate of sticking divided by all the rates, sticking plus desorption plus reaction. Standard formalism. By the way, when I include reaction, it is not just Langmuirian. This is the Langmuir-Hinchelwood model. This is the standard form that describes catalysts, catalytic reactions on the surface. Totally standard, right? Uh, been around for many decades. By the way, is my empirical model and my Langmuirian model equivalent? Because these are the forms I've written down. They don't look quite equivalent. However, if the surface science adsorption rate coefficient equals my K1P and the desorption rate is smallish, then if I divide through by the reaction rate coefficient, these equations are the same. So these are the approximations we're working at. Now, I cannot scientifically tell you that I know that this is Langmuirian, right? You can never prove your microscopics from a macroscopic formalism. But what I can tell you is the langmuir hinchelwood model that works in so many fields easily explains the behavior we see. So my scientific comment is simply there is no motivation from the data to invoke anything more complicated than that. Sticking, desorption, and reaction, that's it. You can't really have less physical terms than those. By the way, let's look at that for a moment. Uh, so in my wonderful case of saturation, which is here marked Langmuirian, if I look in a trench, so this is now the depth scaled to the width, the Langmuirian case will keep almost the same growth rate up to the point when I'm really exhausting almost all the gas. And then, of course, it has to fall. So I'm sort of site blocked here. I lose the site blocking, and I just plain run out of gas. OK? With a constant sticking term, my fall off looks like this. So my film thickness is very ununiform. Notice, however, that in this case, my consumption of gas is actually much higher here. So if I plot now a plot of growth rate and a plot of pressure, actually the pressure is falling more in the site block case because I'm chewing up more gas. One other difference between the left and the right, this is an infinitely deep trench, so the boundary condition out here is pressure is zero. This is a finite aspect ratio, so um, the pressure drops here come to a nearly flat small slope at the bottom. They're hitting the trench bottom. But it's interesting, right? We always have to keep in mind growth rate does one thing, pressure drop does another. Well, I've told you a lot about pressure. And uh, 
One question is, are we taking advantage of it, really? So many years of our work took place in this surface science-like high vacuum machine, right? Lots of stainless steel, aluminum foil. But it's dynamically pumped. So I have a source of precursor. I'm going to shoot it at the sample. But I'm going to pump on that chamber like crazy. Wow. In fact, the reaction probability at the sample is a very small number. So most of my gas, it may hit the sample, most of it's pumped out. That's really inefficient. So what should I do? I should actually use the poor man's approach, which is a Pyrex tube and a clamshell furnace. So here's what we'll do. We'll put the precursor, which may be a solid or liquid, in a reservoir. We'll initially pump out this tube, then close those valves, let the precursor equilibrate to its full vapor pressure in that tube. We will precharge the tube with, for example, 15 torr of the hafnium diboride precursor, and then slowly ramp up the tube furnace, which by the way means the temperature will slowly coast up through reaction onset, where the growth rate is very, very small. So we have a huge pressure, 15 torr precursor, and an extremely slow growth rate at onset, and see what we can do in an apparatus that right, costs us as much as a Pyrex tube costs. The, my grad student who worked on this, he was always ragging on this, our cost versus his cost. Anyway, so let's do an extraordinarily hard problem. Let's try to put a coating inside an aerogel, which is a network of interconnected porous passageways with a typical dimension of 5 or 10 nanometers. So when you try to put material in a structure like this, the effective aspect ratio is like tens of thousands to one. So we have some controls where we didn't do anything. This was a pancake-like cylinder, we broke it into four, stuck these two pieces in that furnace, and uh, we actually took a day to do this, but we're not consuming any gas. You charge it up, you program the furnace, and you go home. Right? And you let it run, and this is a, um, uh, an x-ray computed tomograph, so this bright intensity is scattering of the x-rays by hafnium, which is a high Z element. And we actually get a lot of film in the first couple of millimeters, which was a tremendous filling job. <coughs> Our buddies who've tried to do this with ALD can do it um, competitively or not. We're, we're, this is actually the regime where we, I don't like to overstress competition, but we actually do beat out ALD. And I've discussed it with Roy and Jeff and the others. They agree CBD ought to outperform here. What else? Let's take, there's some now other effects that occur. Here's growth of iron. We were doing thin film magnetics for Seagate. So we worked a lot on CBD of iron cobalt compounds. Iron from the well-known iron carbonyl precursor. Plenty of vapor pressure. In the typical CBD, the results you get are really very marginal. Here's sparse nucleation and all this rough structure. Here's a coating. Well, this is not a high aspect ratio, right? This is like one and a half to one. It's basically just a notch. And we get this horrible bumpy film. And when we put it in our static CVD at the full vapor pressure of this molecule, suddenly it's smooth. We're completely filling trenches, infilling colloidal crystals. This is from the Paul Braun group. Um, here's some gallium arsenide nanowires from EPFL in Switzerland. And we're coating these really quite uniformly. Suddenly a lot of things are possible. So what's our comment? Well, I've expanded the precursor pressure and have started growth at very low temperature. You'll notice, by the way, in a standard system you think there's a, an onset temperature. And you think so because you're blowing precursor out the exhaust stack and you don't want to wait all day. So in your experimental time scale, you think nothing happens below a certain temperature. But in static CVD, as it slowly ramps up, 
in an Arrhenius world, actually things happen at modest temperature. So in static CVD, reaction onset is lower, accessible pressure is higher, and that means the zone's bigger, and the aspect ratios you can coat are much higher. So that's what's happening. New capability. Um, okay. I will check time. We still have some time. However, here's the problem of the precursors. Isn't it great when you have one of life's few precursors that gives you 15 torr of pressure? Well, you can do a lot of things when you have just the right molecule. Many precursors have modest vapor pressure and never fully enter the self-site blocking regime. So there's a question, are we stuck? The answer, fortunately, is no, we're not stuck. Let's, you understand the surface kinetics involve molecules that adsorb block sites, but mostly desorb. They mostly don't react, they mostly desorb. Let's try to find growth inhibitors which increase the site blocking effect, or there could be a second pathway called associative desorption to reduce the reactivity of the precursor. What might this be? Here's an example. We were growing uh, titanium diboride films from this precursor. It's this metal borohydride, but titanium can't be in the plus four valence. So you can't put four ligands around this thing. You can only put three, and to get it volatile, you have to add a neutral molecule. DME, think of it like a solvent molecule. Dimethoxyethane bonds modestly to this precursor, and when you come down to the growth surface, this DME coordinates off and just evaporates. It doesn't break down to poison the film with, for example, carbon. This is a, right? methyl group in there. So if we take even a Le Chatelier approach, we know that this doesn't poison the film. Let's add from an independent container an overpressure of DME back onto the surface. Now in chemical reaction kinetics, right, if you add more species on the product side, the net reaction stays more right on the reactant side. So let's see what happens. Again, empirically, here's the growth rate versus the added pressure of DME. And we can drop it down here across this modest pressure range uh, by a factor. Now, the effective reaction probability is not one of these fabulous numbers like 10 to the minus fourth. It's maybe a number like 5 to 10 percent. However, that's the difference between no conformal coating and some pretty good conformal coating in trenches that may be 5 or 10 to 1 in depth. So here's an example. These are both thickness measurements in very, very deep trenches. So the thickness actually tapers to zero at the end. Just with the precursor, here's the growth rate falling off. And when I add the overpressure of the inhibitor, I drop down the growth rate at the opening and that thickness falls much more slowly. This is in a very deep trench where it tapers to zero. If there's a trench bottom somewhere, this becomes almost flat. So I take a non-conformal molecule, I connect up a bit of a compatible inhibitor and I make it be a conformal growth system for modest aspect ratios. Can we play this trick some more? Well, here's some iron growth from iron carbonyl, not in my static CVD apparatus. So this is if you walk in the lab and try it, and you get this marvelously horrible result, unless you like artistic cross sections, where the thickness, right, it's like growing cauliflower on the top of these columns. And then you just walk in there and add some more CO as an inhibitor, having equipped your lab with CO detectors, right? Okay. So there are a lot of systems out there where we've, precursor has been out there, fine, the literature says, but you know what? Forget everything except flat substrates, but that's not true. 
we can use some chemical insights and now make conformal films in certain structures. Are more inhibitors possible? We certainly haven't tried all of these, but I want to comment from the literature, there are a variety of things that have been identified that are known to suppress growth rate in these precursor systems. So can we do everything? Can we do anything? Of course not. But there will, like any process, there will be a portfolio of systems for which things work. And uh, we have busily tried a number of these. Turns out ammonia is amazingly good in a lot of systems. Ammonia is pretty sticky. And it doesn't decompose till about 375 centigrade. Turns out ammonia turns out to be the film grower's best friend. Um, if you want a little bit of surface science, you'll notice when this precursor comes to a surface, what I said was the first step is to coordinate off this DME. If on the surface a DME could coordinate back onto it, that's called associative desorption. I recombine to recreate the original molecule that leaves. For the numerous surface science buffs in the audience, if you write out what that looks like in surface science notation, where theta is the fraction of surface coverage with a species, ranging from 0 to 1. It looks like this, and so it turns out you have a term in the numerator, which is the effect of site blocking if it's doing site blocking, and another term in the denominator, which accounts for associative desorption if that's the dominant mechanism. And in empirical experiments, you can't actually tell whether it's dominated by this term or that term or both. To prove things you have to do in situ surface science, such as measuring dynamic coverages with reflection infrared, which is on our list of things to do, but that's kind of hard. So tune in for the next PhD. I'll have that answer. OK. Well, inhibitors do more things for you. So here's a very interesting example. How many of you have tried to grow a beautiful, smooth film, a couple nanometers thick? Was it beautifully smooth? Right, I didn't think so. So its problem is you're often limited by nucleation, right? How do you fix it? You do heroic things. You may chemically treat your surface. You may ion bombard it to actually try to create chemical binding sites. But by the way, you can't do ion bombardment in a deep trench. You can't treat the walls uniformly. Right? You can't use a plasma or ozone. The activated species die off near the opening of the trench. You just never manage to treat deep down. So here's our favorite uh, material, hafnium diboride, on nice electronic grade SAO2, and the nucleation is terrible. Right? Here's an AFM. This is the 20 nanometer height scale. There's a lot of bare surface, and we have some islands here that are 10 to 20 nanometers tall. And we were busy trying to grow an entire film that was two nanometers thick. And we instead end up with a field of boulders on the nanoscale. So let's think again about inhibitors. I've said to you that in steady state growth, the inhibitor may come down and adsorb to the surface and site block. That means the precursor mostly bounces off and only occasionally in a site where an ammonia has left recently, can my inhibitor, my precursor, come down and stick. So once I have film and the inhibitor sticks to it, I can really turn growth almost off. By the way, suppose that the same inhibitor doesn't bind well to the bare substrate. There's a temperature range where the ammonia doesn't stick very well to SiO2, but it sticks really well to film. You put these together, and what do you have? You start to grow a little island, and it gets covered over, not permanently, but on a dynamic kinetic basis with inhibitor. It doesn't grow very fast. 
Meanwhile, out on the bare substrate, this inhibitor isn't sticking and nucleation keeps going. So that's what we had, right? And here's, by the way, the height distribution function. We expand it to show you this tail out here to great heights. These are these tall boulders sticking up. And now we just turn on the ammonia. Now we have to wait a little longer. You can hardly see the height distribution function because it's this red function here, almost the same as the substrate. And on the AFM, the height scale here is now three nanometers max. And it's filled in with these beautiful, fairly uniform nuclei. Because we turned off the ability of the initial nuclei to grow. That's really cool. So now let's, we have a one knob way of totally controlling nucleation between big boulders and fine, beautiful nuclei, densely packed. There's the comparison, right? Let's now ask, how does the initial nucleation affect the roughness of a thicker film you might grow on top, right? Because there's often a contention in literature that, well, you know, nucleation can be a little bad. We're going to bury it out, right? And eventually grow a smooth film. So let's try burying it out. Here's my rotten starting surface. Now, I can have the inhibitor off or on during growth. I remind you, if I leave the inhibitor on, it's a very low sticking probability situation that favors smoothness. So what do we see after growing, let's say, seven or eight nanometers on top? Poor nuclei, fast growth, it's really rough. If you want nano sandpaper, you've got it, right? It's just we haven't even reached full coalescence. Now, if I make nucleate this way, and grow with low sticking probability, actually start to fill in, but you never ever get rid of the roughness that you grew in during nucleation. Right? You're really stuck. All right, let's go to the good starting surface. And again, we're going to grow without inhibitor or with inhibitor. What's so interesting here is when the starting surface is really smooth, even when you grow without the inhibitor, under rather high sticking probability conditions, it stays pretty smooth. Why? Thin film growth is mathematically unstable against roughening, basically due to shadowing, if you have initial perturbations. If you make the initial perturbations almost go away, then you can grow under very fast high sticking conditions and you haven't really turned on the instability yet. So nucleation is a big deal. I can talk all day about conformality, but if we can't nucleate well, we're pretty stuck. You'll notice that ammonia never breaks down and reacts. So if I turn the ammonia on first, it doesn't matter how big my aspect ratio is. It could be 10,000 to 1. As long as I wait long enough, the ammonia will diffuse in and equilibrate, and all surfaces will have a dynamic coverage of ammonia. Then I turn on the growth precursor. And nucleation is the same everywhere. We actually, I don't have the slide here, we've been nucleating islands at aspect ratios of 1,000 to 1 and running the AFM afterwards. And what you get at 1,000 to 1 is the same as what you get near the opening. So, ammonia. It's your best friend. A um, couple of other things, because once you get into this, it's hard to stop. I have a long background in plasma processes. You know, they look great. Where we took the shield off, here's an external microwave, 100 watt pocket microwave cavity. We were going to dissociate hydrogen or nitrogen and squirt onto the growth surface a very reactive species, atomic hydrogen or atomic nitrogen. Now let's start out with a certain precursor and growing under some conditions. You'll see it's a little warm and the pressure is a little low. Uh, we get to pinch off. The reactivity is too high. It grows near the opening, right? Gets thicker here and pinches off. Now I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but I'm going to turn on the atomic hydrogen. And I'm showing you a result which 
should not be possible according to Fick's law, which is it's thicker at the bottom than the top. So I took a mess and turned it into something like this. And by the way, if you keep going, it fills up. Because with a V-shape at the bottom, the walls just grow in. It goes zip and gets totally filled. So what's happening? Well, the atomic hydrogen is highly reactive, but can then recombine on the surface and leave as H2. So the surfaces that pinch off are those that are in have the greatest line of sight to the growth source, the biggest solid angle. The same geometric argument tells you these upper surfaces have the biggest line of sight to the reactive inhibitor. So now atomic hydrogen sticks essentially where it hits, turns growth way down. There's no inhibition effect at depth because the atomic hydrogen all gets consumed before then. And in this case, we don't change the film stoichiometry. The hydrogen sticks, it leaves afterwards. We have actually now this and another process for compound materials that give intrinsic bottom-up growth. So in the filling game, this is a really important new entry. We can V-shape the bottom of things and just grow the V on out. Uh, and we'll just end with... Uh, a kind of fun comparison side. I didn't talk to you today about our oxide work. We have lots of them. We have actually precursors for all of the rare earths, the whole lanthanide series. Um, the one f for also uh, titanium, magnesium. We make beautiful magnesium oxide at slightly lower temperature. You drop down the growth rate. You can coat very, very deep structures, or in a somewhat more open aspect ratio, you can coat and fill faster. That's very nice. Here's hafnium diboride, which has been the principal subject of my talk. Here is a really fun substrate that IBM gave us. Uh, it has some openings, and it has buried internal pipes. So this is the fracture surface. During growth, the precursor had to come through the opening, round the corner, and it started coating through the horizontal pipe. And we happened to fracture through right here. And you can see how nicely it's coating, making its way along horizontally under the surface. So conclusions. High pressure for site blocking, use of an inhibitor, uh, or even superconformal growth. And how do we make real progress? We've collaborated for 15 years with the Girolami group in chemistry. They make all the precursors. So if, if it's C for chemistry and you want to make progress, work with a brilliant chemist. Thank you all very much. All right, we have five minutes for questions. Do you think ALD has any fundamental limitations other than the availability of chemical precursors? In uh, real, so just to make sure everyone understands. So ALD separates growth into two component reactions. The idea is you have a precursor and a co-reactant. Growth only occurs. So you expose the surface to one and wait until that molecule adsorbs everywhere. And it doesn't do, in principle, it doesn't do anything else but adsorb. Then you pump that out, leaving the layer sitting on the surface. Then flow in the co-reactant, which comes in and cleaves off the unwanted ligand groups from the first. And it gets to saturation, and in principle, nothing else happens. And then you pump that out, and you go back to the first step. So there are a couple of aspects here. One is the statement that nothing else happens, right? There's some systems where it's ALD with a tiny CVD rate underneath. The other point is you have all this exposure and weight and pump out and weight. The time it takes to get a molecule to diffuse in is going like the aspect ratio squared. So the dosing time, and then when you pump out, it's again like aspect ratio squared. Dose with the other one. 
So once the aspect ratio is high, you're waiting a longer and longer time to do this. Now you can overcome it with high pressure. The result of this is that in a real process, when you're optimizing for rate, your dosing and pumping times you tend to make just barely long enough. And in a detailed view, the thickness in ALD isn't actually quite uniform. It often tapers just slightly at the bottom, which is a well-known effect. You can make it nearly perfect if you wait longer. But so can I by dropping my growth rate. So in a sense, we're both trading. We have an adsorption effect and a rate effect. ALD is in principle more elegant if the molecule behaves exactly as stated. But in reality, you may have a little incidental reaction. You have a right, diffusion in and diffusion out time. Uh, it gets harder and harder at high aspect ratio. So you understand I'm not knocking ALD. It's fabulous. But the reality is they have a collection of molecules that work just right and which gives them Right? Enabling ability for processing. CVD has some different molecules that have great properties. So really you just, you want a certain material and you say, I'm kind of process neutral. Which one has the golden boy molecule? That's really what it's like. Can we go back to the last slide with the IBM sample? Yeah. So you showed two different growth rates um, for hafnium. Mm -hmm. Do you see any quality difference between the films that were grown at 300 versus 200? Yes. Um, of course, this is very system dependent. We are aware that when we grow at lower temperature, this particular material incorporates a little more hydrogen. Interestingly, the base stoichiometry boron to hafnium stays within experimental error of characterization techniques, stays at 2 to 1. Um, we've done a variety of things. Uh, the fusion barrier measurements, it blocks copper totally. And we did that under contract to Intel. Uh, we've done tribology measurements. In nanoindentation, it's just a wee bit softer. But it turns out that particular material, there's a big puzzle anyway. In this temperature range, it's apparently amorphous. But I don't know what a hexagonal, it's the aluminum diboride crystal structure. I don't actually know what amorphous would mean for that crystal system. And we strongly suspect that it's really ultra nanocrystalline. But I don't have the proof. That's very hard to get at, it turns out, very surprisingly hard. Um, as deposited, this has a nanoindentation hardness like 19 gigapascals. It like way outruns tungsten and molybdenum. Uh, we've annealed it and then it explicitly goes nanocrystalline. So, okay, this material melts at 3200 C, right? We deposit at 200, right? It only melts at 3200. When we anneal it like crazy, which means 700 C, it barely manages to crystallize. And the grain size is about 5 to 8 nanometers. And the hardness goes up. So we can take the initial value and go up to maybe 30 gigapascals. These are some amazing materials. Um, quick question. Is the copper deposited this way polycrystal or amorphous? The, the copper? Uh, it's like there was a one line of copper there. I'm not aware that you can actually deposit amorphous copper. The FCC metals are very, very hard to make amorphous. Now, I'm not sure we actually did diffraction on our deposited copper films, but we did anneal them in situ. We were doing bias temperature stress measurements. Um, if they were apparently amorphous, it would be because they're heavily contaminated, which they weren't. The growth process, 
using this very well-known copper HVAC VTMS precursor makes quite clean films. You have to really use you know, very high temperature conditions to start to crack the ligands. So no, I, I assume it's fairly typical fine-grained polycrystalline copper. Um, yes, that's complicated because in a very thin film, if it's very thin and if it's not perfectly flat, you have a great deal of surface scattering. So we were up at um, a, some number of microm centimeters. Of course, bulk copper is 1.6. But when we stacked up our data head to head against other literature reports for films a few nanometers thick, we were similar. So. Everybody has to contend with small grain size and surface roughness. How big of a role does the substrate material itself play? For example, if you have one material at the bottom of the trench and then a dissimilar material on the side wall, mm -hmm. the growth rate is going to be dramatically different. Nucleation could be quite different. Once, of course, it's covered with this film, then the identity of the substrate is gone. Um, I'll just point out uh, another end branch of this is can the substrate materials be so dissimilar that on one of them nucleation never ever happens? That's the basis for intrinsically selective growth. That's actually possible and there's this intriguing question, could I use an inhibitor to actually really try to force growth off? And the answer is you can do it, but um, here's the thing. The, an intrinsic problem with selective growth is you're totally sensitive to any defect, right? It could be a broken bond on the surface, a speck of dust. Nucleation will take a foothold. And it will be overall selective growth, except you'll have... And this point was brought home to me. I was uh, sitting in a conference, maybe the AVS conference, chatting between sessions. And I was saying, you know, I'm working on nucleation and it's so hard and you get all these problems. And the guy next to me said, oh, I love, I love nucleation. I said, why? He said, well, I'm interested in perfect surfaces. And I'm always trying to put a little film on there because it's the greatest way to find all my defects. So he's growing ultra-perfect films. Just run a little CVD gas. Oh, look, there are all my defects, which are undetectable by other means. A few broken bonds on the surface. You grow these little islands, you know right away how well you've done. So I, I greatly admire selective growth, but I'm aware that if you really mean perfect, right, you're going to have to be in conditions that maybe only Intel can achieve in terms of cleanliness and uniformity. Um, we have not done, uh, let me give you two answers. So macroscopically, one thing you look for is if you've broken the inhibitor, you find its elements in the film. With, for example, the dimethoxyethane, if I bump the growth temperature up higher, it starts to crack. So I can easily make titanium diboride with carbon in it, which is actually somewhat interesting in its own right, tribologically. Now, um, in the copper case, the typical molecule is <coughs> copper, HVAC, VTMS. It turns out, so the VTMS is this neutral group that coordinates off. You can put in the reactor alternates to the VTMS, various, very similar ligands like DMB. We have done that and looked in a mass spectrometer, and we see floating around in the gas precursor molecules that have switched the neutral ligand. So in that case, in the copper case, and this was well known anyway, you can show that associative desorption occurs quite readily on the surface. Right? So we're tagging them with the identity of the 
the neutral ligand and they, they switch. So, right, so when you want to find that out, you look for impurities. Um, depending on the system, you could think about isotopic labeling. Or if you can switch between otherwise similar ligands, you look for ligand exchange. Basic ways to do it. All right, that's about our time. Let's thank uh, Professor Alvin again. Thank all of you very much.